So I'm here with uh, Lish Garner, uh, one of LE Mental Health's uh, franchise owners, and you know we're gonna talk about a important topic today. You know, in particular, how companies that are predominantly run and led by white people do diversity right and do it well. Um, so do you want to tell tell the audience and the world a little bit about who you are? Yeah, absolutely. Um, hey, everybody. My name is Lish Garner. I am currently in Mansfield, Texas. Um, kind of had a roundabout way career-wise, so started off in instructional design, went into being a Six Sigma black belt for a few years, moved to the Virgin Islands, which was really cool, lived there for three years before I moved to Texas, um, and now doing project management. So, you know, I have a lot of healthcare experience in a you know few different areas, and then um, you know coming to mental health is just like full circle. So that's a little bit about me. Cool. Yeah, and so uh, I'm Lucas Vellini, uh, vice president with LE Mental Health, uh, clinical quality learning and development, education, a lot of our creative stuff and content that we've been generating. So I think and some background on Ellie uh, for folks that don't know uh, we've recently recently launched a franchise model and so what a franchise model means and why we went with the franchise model over a corporate model was because with a corporate model it's kind of like a rubber stamp like a cookie cutter so Ellie started in Minnesota we know what works in Minnesota because it's run by people who live here we get the culture we're a part of these communities with the franchise system um, instead of us just buying, you know, spaces, hiring clinic directors and, you know, having just another replication of what we do here, by doing a franchise model, it's people who know their community just as well as we know ours, um, and they don't have to have a clinical background. And so I think, you know, one of the, one of the reasons I was interested in kind of having a conversation uh, with you today, Lish, is I think our lives kind of my whole life has been in mental health. You know, I've been a therapist, a clinician. Uh, I was predominantly in higher education as a professor for eight years. And then I step into Ellie Mental Health, which is one of the country's fastest growing franchises, you know, and find myself at an executive level of, you know, being a vice president in a corporation, you know, and so I'm kind of transitioning into corporate, uh, into corporate life and corporate culture at the same time that you've you've lived in corporate culture Absolutely. you know that world well and now you're kind of transitioning into mental health and so i think that's a unique uh kind of intersection for us the other one being um you know you're a black woman and i'm a white man yes. um and so one of the things you know and you and i we've we've kind of had this conversation at a surface level um you know, we don't always get to spend too much time together, uh, given geographic uh, constraints. But one of the things I definitely wanted to talk about, and one of the things that's always interested me, um, is just kind of picking your brain on how predominantly, how companies that are predominantly led by white people, mm -hmm. how we can do culture and diversity well and do it right. I love that question. Um, I think a lot of times, the DNI stamp is kind of thrown out there yeah. so often. It's the thing to do. It's what we're supposed to do, but the intention isn't always where it should be. Yeah. And so, you know, one thing that I was really, really focused on when joining Ellie, just going through this process is how keen are you on diversity and inclusion? What are your processes? Like, what are the different things that we are gonna do and be intentional about? in order to bring in different demographics into this this model. And so for me, when I'm looking at, you know, having these conversations and being very transparent about what this particular community needs, it's advocates that can be very authentic in their experiences without being told they're too much. Um, a lot of times, you know, we'll talk about microaggressions or we'll talk about things that we've dealt with in the workplace and it's like, well, are you sure you took it the right way? Or are you sure they really meant it that way? Versus saying, I acknowledge your existence. I acknowledge the experience that you've had. And instead of trying to micromanage my feelings or where I'm coming from and the place that I'm coming from, genuinely trying to learn from that. And so, 
you know, just talking with you and your openness to want to have these really tough conversations in a space where typically we've kind of been left out of the, the conversation. We've always been an afterthought. Well, you know, that demographic doesn't necessarily believe in therapy, but do you know why they don't yeah. necessarily yeah. believe in therapy? And I think some of that stems from, you know, the medical system as a whole. If you study history, um, medicine hasn't always been kind to the black community. Mm -mm. We have been those that have been persecuted. We've been experimented on. There's been cover-ups and all of these things. And whether we know it from a historical perspective, we'll feel it when we go into an office or meet with a provider. They're, they're thinking we don't have the same amount of pain. And so those are the things that are really keeping us from this area in healing as well as just healthcare in general. So, you know, these these types of conversations, these avenues, these platforms are incredibly important. Yeah, and, and a lot of what you're talking about, like it's not ancient history. Correct. You know, a lot of these things, and you know, some of this stuff are products of the disproportion of, you know, like Martin Luther King Jr. photos in black and white, you know, when we had, <laughs> we were beyond the technology of black and white photos at the time. You know, Absolutely. it's like the man would still be alive today. He could very well still be alive today. Um, yet, however, we react as if we've kind of moved on and these aren't still highly relevant. Um, but even like you said, when you, when you walk into a space, it's like you feel it, you mm -hmm. know, and it's, it's even a lot of the research on epigenetics, you know, has really identified empirically um, and, and through science how trauma is, li is transgenerational, like it's passed down in our genetics. Um, and so, yeah, it's it's still a massive barrier at the level of, of access, of stigma. Um, but even when we talk about stigma, I think when it comes to the black community, it's different. You know, like it's not the stigma of, ooh, therapy, like I don't want people to think I'm crazy. Yeah. Like it's more of, I don't even know if stigma qualifies because it's grounded in everything you were just saying, legitimate experiences of being experimented on, of being exploited, of being lied to. Um, so it's not just a matter of stigma. It's, it's an incredible matter. It's a matter of mistrust. Exactly. Yeah. I think that's the perfect way to kind of look at it as a whole. Um, I come from a community where we're always looking for clinicians, whether it's a dentist or doctors or anyone in the healthcare field where we see ourselves in them because it just gives us a little bit more security to say, okay, you kind of get it. Like you understand when I'm telling you I'm in pain that I'm not necessarily making it up just to get a prescription. Um, and I think that that's happened so many times and you'll even see with the mortality rate of black women having babies right now. Yeah. It's through the roof because doctors are not listening to the patient. Yeah, you right know? now, today. In this right country. now, today. This is not happening 50 years ago. This is something that is being brought to light. There's so many more stories of black women dying during childbirth. We are in the 21st century with amazing technology. That should not be the case if we were just being heard, listened to, and you know, brought to a point where now we're not considered complainers. We're you know just complaining just for the sake of complaining when we're actually trying to bring some of these issues to the forefront. Yeah. Yeah. And so like part of that change is absolutely going to have to be representation, you know, and so part, part of the franchise model has opened up doors um, for folks of those communities to kind of bring uh, clinics and access to mental health there. And that'll certainly play a significant part. You know, we're also you know, we need to diversify uh, the profession, you know, yes, so people, absolutely. people need to see providers, you know, that reflect to them, um, just an understanding that they don't, they don't have to question whether or not the person is going to understand, you know, it's like you could walk and sit down and not have an experience of, okay, how much, you know, how much am I going to have to teach this white person? Mm -hmm. um, or how much am I going to have to put up with, you know, and tolerate just so I could still get some brand of, you know, the treatment and care that I need, you know, but both of those things are going to be slow changes, you know, like yeah. it's, it's in Minnesota, I know with marriage and family therapists, um, it's like, it's like 2% African American providers. Um, and so we're, we're doing what we can to, you know, get into high schools, increase awareness around 
considering mental health as a future profession. And so we need to have long-term goals and we've implemented those, you know, but in the meantime, we can't just wait for those to manifest. Right. Um, and so because it's so dominated by uh, white people, not just as a clin clinicians and providers, but again, even in our company, like our executive leadership is predominantly white at Ellie Mental Health, you know, and it's, it's, it's not something we try to, that's just something that's obvious. It is. Um, and so at the kind of like at the corporate level, at the company level, as we're trying to grow this brand and, you know, I've been fortunate to have a lot of opportunity to have a lot of say in how we build this brand. And so there are landmines everywhere. Oh yeah. You know, like it's, it's, and there's no obvious answer, you know, like when it comes to like one of the conversations we ha uh, had and that you really helped us with was how we're representing people on our website. You know, like that's a huge aspect of how our brand commun you know, tries to go about communicating what we're about um, and getting there was difficult. You know, it's like, because I think we've seen, you and I have probably both seen a lot of ways in which corporations don't do this well. Oh, absolutely. And so maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think one of the things that really stuck out, you know, just talking about the website, I was interviewing my clinical director that I, I have now. He's amazing, um, really brilliant guy. And when he interviewed with me, he said, I read the job description and it talked about diversity and all these things that you want to do. But yet I went to the website and I didn't see that reflected. And so when I applied, I was kind of thinking to myself, we'll see how this goes. And it was really interesting as we were talking and I immediately shot off an email and I'm like, listen, I'm looking for these, you know, pockets of people who represent this diverse aspect and they don't believe us. We have to fix this immediately. This is like a dire need because people are researching the company. We're talking about diversity and inclusion. We're doing all of these efforts, but we're not advertising that yeah. way. And so I was really excited to see that, you know, there was a huge push very quickly to get that remedied. But then you still have like some of the images that can sometimes seem stereotypical. Yeah. And they weren't meant to be that yeah. way, but for a community that is always kind of stereotyped or put in a box or looked at to be a certain way, it does make them a little more sensitive when they see that. So it can be an immediate turnoff to say, oh, they don't get it. They're talking about diversity and inclusion, but they still don't get it. So I think it's really, really important to have individuals that have lived that corporate experience and they're looking at it from two different lenses. The professionalism side, like what's gonna be good for the company, the brand, the overall look and feel, but then you're adding in that lived experience piece. You can't teach that. You can't teach lived experience. So, you know, it really makes a, a big, bigger difference for me to come in and say, hey, Lucas, I know you really tried with that one, but that's really gonna hurt this part particular group of people and here's why and be able to go through that yeah. conversation and be very honest about that and I love the fact that Ellie is open to that because a lot of times in corporate situations it's kind of like well we did what we could yeah, yeah. take as, what you can get as soon as you said that like I three sentences in I was just like damn it <laughs> <laughs> uh you know just did one of those stupid things white people do um you know, and I, I think we could just like say, we could just say what it was. Um, we, and so when we realized that the website was not representing, you know, what, mm -hmm. what we are really committed to being about. Right. Um, yeah, it's like we took action. The, the first thing I didn't want to do is just, you know, go to uh, adobestockphotos.com and get like the standard stock photos. Because I think yeah. that's an example of when you see a company not doing it well. You know, it's like they, they want to present an optic, you know, of diversity. Um, yeah. And you you can, you just know a stock photo when you see one. You do. Um, and so we did a photo, you know, I scheduled a photo shoot, um, it was during one of our Ellie Academies. And, cause one of the other things that was important to me was like, I, I wanted real people. Mm -hmm. You know, ideally I wanted our people because there is an incredible amount of diversity within our growing franchise system. Um, and even here in Minnesota, you know, it, it's, we've really come a long ways from even, you know, two years ago. Um, and 
as we were doing the photo shoot, you know, we were playing a whole lot of Madonna and Vogue, you know. Um, we were having fun. Like it, The energy was, was really cool that day. And so at one point, you know, one of a um, uh, black clinic director, you know, grabs the boom box. And we have, like, a big Ellie branded bump box. You know? Yeah. Um, puts it on the shoulder. You know, like, he loved it. We all loved it. And, like, these photos, they were great. Like, they were great photos. He was all about it. So we put it on the website. But I would say the mistake we made there was taking something that wasn't necess- it wasn't culturally insens- insensitive within the context of how that picture came to life. Right. Um, but then losing sight of the fact that the rest of the world has no idea that yeah. that's where it came from, how that photo, you know, kind of came came to life. And so, yeah, it's like as soon as you said that, I was like, I was like it's like, yeah. This is an obnoxious stereotype. Yeah. Um, and we got it off the website like immediately. Um, mm-hmm. So it, you know that that was kind of another quick one there, but you know it, it's still. And th- this has been another interesting experience for me. Um, you know, trying to sort all this stuff out. Like I love our uh, DEI director uh, that we have here, Sean McMore. Um, and when I first started doing a lot of our creative stuff, like I know he's gonna be a resource and an ally. Um, and so right off the bat, I, you know, I was just like, Sean, there, let's, like, we just gotta, let's just say it, like, let's just call it, it's like, there are times where I'm just gonna have to tell you, like, we need diversity represented in this product and that, and it's like, that's a weird conversation to have. Yeah. It's an uncomfortable, it's like, so like, what, what's the right way to go about doing that, if not just calling it what it is, you know, and, and doing it. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's one of those things, there's not a one size fits all approach. Um, and to your point, we do want it to be authentic. That's like the pillar that Ellie is branded on. We want people that are representative of the company, but we also need to make sure that we are showing or showcasing the types of people we're targeting as well. Um, I'll just give you an example. So right now, Within all of the ads that we see on TV, whenever you see a black person, the person that they have teamed up as their significant other tends to be everything but black. Yeah. And I realize that companies think that they're showing diversity, but really what you're telling my child, who is 10 years old, is that you can date everybody else but somebody that looks like you. And they don't realize how damaging that is to the psyche of a child Mm -hmm. because you are not giving them any representation of their family structure and what that looks like. And I am really, really trying to make sure that Ellie doesn't do that. You know, um, it's really important for me to show that is absolutely a family structure. But that does not need to be every single family on TV. Even gay couples, there's a black man Mm -hmm. and a white, Hispanic, whomever, significant other. It's never a black family, a black couple, a black mom and dad, black kids. But all other races are able to showcase that. And so for me, that just doesn't sit well. That doesn't feel good. That doesn't feel authentic. You know, my family is all black. We're not a mixed family. Um, And so when my daughter watches TV and she's like, wow, you know, I don't really see anybody that depicts my family structure. We need to make sure that we're addressing that. So I want to make sure that we keep that on the forefront. And, you know, these types of conversations really bring that to light. Again, not saying that there's anything wrong with a mixed family, but also showcase an entire family. Yeah, we're kind of like frozen in this it's like like interracial couples yes it's so progressive mm-hmm. you know it's like we're, we're doing it it's like we've done it you know and it's like but when that's all we're doing and when we freeze there it's almost like like l- look at this black person who was able to partner with a non-black person how mm-hmm. great is that exactly you know, or like look at this non-black person who's partnered with a black person how great is that you know but it's like where is the yeah where is the black family mm-hmm. um because when it comes to the black family, they're at least, you know, from, from what I've come to learn, um, I, I, I was blessed to have uh, a few uh, black moms in my life growing up, you know, because when, when you grow up with uh, a lot of my friends were black and 
you know, when, when you, when you, when I'd go to their house, it's like their mom immediately became my mom. Like I had no say in it, but yeah. it just happened. You know? Absolutely. Um, um, and there are a lot of things that are so special and distinct about the black family. And so when those things aren't depicted properly, it's almost like those things are, I don't know if I want to, you know, it's, it, I'm always cautious to get into like political hyperbole, um, but like erasing it, you know, to some degree, or, or at the very least, keeping it invisible. Correct. Like all the things that are to be um, cherished and appreciated and admired about uh, the black family system. It's like, yeah, why isn't that more at the forefront? You know, but going back to how that gets depicted, you know, kind of in the corporate, corporate sphere, maybe one of the questions I have is, and I know nobody's a spokesperson on behalf of their entire demographic group, um, but like how, how, do, how would you say either you've experienced or if you've had these conversations with other people of color, like when they're, do they want to be invited to do stuff like this? Like, do they want to be invited to show up and represent who they are in their family? Because I think that's one of the things that like white people are just terrified to ask black people to do. I don't, I don't think that they will be terrified. I think if you're- Well, the white people are terrified to Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. I can see that. And I mean, that's where it comes in, where if you have individuals like myself, I will absolutely advocate and have those conversations on your behalf because I can add more context to why I'm asking you to join this. I can get my friends. Like I have a bunch of friends that would be willing to do this because they're really behind the mental health push they understand I'm opening up a clinic. They they are supportive of it. They're supportive of my vision. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity for us to even use some of my pockets of people, you know? Um, so I don't want white folks to be scared to approach that conversation, especially if it's coming from a genuine place. Yeah. Like if you're saying, you know, I hear you, it's, it, we're, we're doing things a little lopsided. How can we do this better and how can we bring in real people that actually fit this mold? That's going to be so powerful for the brand as a whole because now it doesn't feel like, you know, to your point, I went and got stock photos. This is a real family in Mansfield, Texas, living their life. Yeah. You know, and that's going to be something that's going to resonate with everybody. But what I do have a problem with is when we're so focused on pairing people just because it looks diverse that's, that's what it feels like it's almost like uh like they're trying to get a two for one exactly know? like if we can get a black person that's obviously married to an asian person it's like then we're then we're so much more diverse yes we've checked all the boxes yeah, yeah. <laughs> um but that's missing the point because i you know what i try to be guided by is that the, the point of this it really is just about like representation. Yes, absolutely. You know, it's like show what's real, you know, show what matters. And it's like, don't try to show, don't, don't try to like show something by fabricating it and creating an optic of it. So like if you want to show something, show it by just creating a space for that to be seen. Absolutely. Because um, even you know, when I had that first conversation with our DEI director, and I wasn't really nervous about it because I like saying all the things that, you know, white people are typically terrified to say. Um, <laughs> and, you know, he was just like, oh, all right, you need black people? And I was like, yeah. He's like, okay. Yeah. I'll get you, I'll, I'll get some black people. It's like that. And then I was like, how are you going to do it? He's just like, I'm just going to say, hey, they need some black people for this. Do you yeah. want to do it? Yeah. You know, and it's Very like, it, it is that simple. And then he's like, that's my job. Like, that's what I'm here to do. He's like, I'm committed to and you know kind of growing the representation of black people in this field because it is needed you know it's like mental health as much mistrust as there rightfully is within the medical field and medical industry um it's the solution can't just be living in that mistrust forever because Correct. as you're saying it's like people are dying that don't need to be dying you know it's like people are not getting access to services that do exist like they're there they might they're not they're nearly enough as they need to be as, as far as like proximity and access. Um, but, you know, kind of rebuilding that bridge, you know, is going to require a collective effort. Um, and I, I think even in kind of what you're saying, you know, maybe the recipe, maybe the method is j just being humble, you know, and just like, it's never been difficult for me to 
just be like, yeah, it's like I'm a, I'm a, I'm a white person. White, white people do stupid shit all the time, you know? And it's like, it's, it's just the nature of reality as I see it. So it's like, be open, be humble. When you do something stupid, it's like pay attention so that mm -hmm. when you do something unintentionally dumb, you can recognize it. And then you hopefully you have people in your life that, you know, trust in your intentions enough. And ultimately, I think for someone to trust in your intentions to be good, it's like humility is a huge aspect of that. Um, it's like then ask, you know, or be open to that feedback when you get it. And, but like, don't try. Absolutely. If that makes sense. Yeah. And and align yourself with people who get where you're coming from and what you're trying to accomplish. That can be your allies to bridge the gap between yeah. those communities. Yeah. I think the other challenge for, you know, some different groups of people is that they're trying to do it out on a limb on their own. Well, you don't know how to get through that door. It's just like with, you know, any group of people if you have a ton of cops and you want to break barriers with cops you need a cop that can open that door to help you talk to them oh, yeah. firefighters same thing yeah. teachers unions you know just anyone in those particular arenas who understand how to navigate and talk the language and you know be considered as one of them so that now it's that much easier to kind of get their buy-in yeah and maybe without knowing it you more or less just describe what family therapy is, you know, because that's, that's how you join a system. You know, like if you want, as family therapists, we try to change systems, you know, or optimize systems, um, mm -hmm. help systems become more of what they can be um, and less of what, you know, isn't working for them. And the way you do that is by joining the system. And there's a big distinction in family therapy um, than in like individual therapy. Like individual therapy is a lot about establishing a therapeutic relationship. When family therapists talk about joining a system, like we're literally saying you need to become a part of that system and you need to earn your way in. It's like, they're not just gonna let you in. Absolutely. And it's like the way you earn your way in is just initially paying attention to like, what are the rules that this system is governed by um, and how can I get on board with them? Yeah. Rules of engagement. Yeah. You know, and it's like, and you learn that simply by paying attention and asking the right questions. Um, but it's like, you can't change systems from, so as long as you exist on the outside of it, you know, it's like, you have to, you have, and if you want to change a system that you're not a member of, for instance, like, you know, a lot of people have a lot of very strong feelings about law enforcement. It's like, if you want to see changes happen in law enforcement, um, it's not going to happen by just disparaging law enforcement from afar you know it's like awareness is important you know and it's like there, there needs to be an aspect of awareness but at the same time it's like you need to find a way to enter into that system learn about what's actually going on there um and and, and you do that through trust and so you know i, I think we might be kind of cracking some codes here i'd be careful to ever uh, define it as uh too much of like a foolproof method or you know a recipe you know that that would be dangerous um but what's, yeah, so like, what's your, what, what's your hope? You know, it's like, do, do you have a vision of what this all could look like in five years, 10 years? That's a great one. Um, for me, you know, my vision initially when kind of embarking on this journey was to build a team of just diverse people, period. Um, really focusing on the black community initially and, you know, creating that culture where now I've got a, a few more than just that token black person on the roster that you can come see. You know, I think that a lot of, when I go through different therapeutic um, options, I'll see a token black person, a token yeah. Asian person, versus being very intentional and saying, hey, we've got three or four of, you know, Hispanic, we've got three or four blacks. You know, just being able to have more than one option, and that was really, important for me as I've been trying to build like my team and everything like that, because I'm of the mindset of, I want you to be able to be you. When you're coming through the door, it feels like an extension of home because everyone kind of, they get it. They get not fitting in. They get being eclectic. They get being a little bit different, a little bit quirky. And because of that, 
now we accept each other that much more because I don't have to explain that feeling to you. And so it's really big for me to say, oh, in the next five years, what will that look like? A very strong team that's really guided by that sense of inclusivity, that feeling of belonging, and not just saying it. Like, I really feel like it. When I go to work, if I'm having a bad day, my manager actually cares enough to say, you don't look good. Are you sure you're good? Do we need to switch some things around so that you can take care of yourself and you can manage whatever it is that you have going on? We don't get that enough. We don't get that grace in corporate America a lot of times. It's this job has to be done right here and now. Leave it all at the door. We don't take into consideration that people are human beings and not every day is a good day or not every day um, people are going to say the right things to make you feel a, a good about yourself. So how do you have crucial conversations yeah. and not allow that to fester? So now that you're moving into this space of I can't stand this person, you know, I think that's that's big within a work culture is making it a place where everyone feels OK with having uncomfortable conversations not the most popular conversations and a difference of opinion. Mm -hmm. And that's really big for me. Like I want that type of a culture. We don't have to agree. I might not be your cup of tea, but you respect the fact that I'm living my truth and I'm going to respect yeah. that you're living yours. So that's really how I envision the progression going. Yeah. Yeah. People, everyone's become so fearful of viewpoint diversity. Absolutely. Which is horrible. It terrifies me. Groupthink. Yeah, you know, and it's like, it's like without view, viewpoint diversity is like the most efficient way to solve problems, you know, and it's like, let, let's let ideas be ideas. Um, and if there's a problem, especially a problem as complex as uh, race relations in America, you know, it's like, if you, if you want to try to solve that problem through a singular viewpoint, it's like, good luck. You know, it's like stuff like that is what has paralyzed us in a, uh, or ongoing, you know, advertisement of interracial couples, you mm -hmm. know, as, as if that means we've we we've, we've gotten it. We're there. That is so so. That's a perfect you know way to look at that. It's like America tries to cover up yeah our issues by saying, oh no no we don't have that problem here. No look we're integrated. We're integrated. Yeah. That that that's that solved everything. Mm -hmm. So even though when this couple goes out. One half is going to be treated one way, and the other half is going to be treated another way. We're not going to talk about that. We're just going to sweep that under the rug. You know, that happens all the time. Yeah, yeah. Um, so any, uh, any final words for uh, white people? You know, I think that there, there's a lot more conversations that need to be had. Yeah. I feel like as much progress as we're all working to get to, there just needs to be that point where when we're being, we're calling out bullshit that is not considered as aggressive. Us telling you that you did something wrong is not us being aggressive. It's us trying to tell you, you did something wrong. And like, that's okay. You're not saying you're a horrible person. Correct. You just, you, just, you did something wrong. Yeah. And it's like people do things wrong. That's fine. You know, that's how we learn. Um, you know, I, I think the the framework I've always operated off of, and it's like I didn't learn to do this. It was just organic because, you know, I grew up in Chicago. Like, diversity was always normal to me. And all of my experiences that I had with um, people who lived in uh, predominantly black communities, whether it was my peers or, you know, their parents, um, I'd say their moms in particular, it's like these these – these people don't need my help as a white person. It's like, they just need me to get, get out of the way. Yeah. You know, and it's like, sometimes when, when you, when you, when you try too hard to like help, when someone didn't ask you directly to help, it's like, all you do is that, that can present another barrier, mm -hmm. you know? So it's like, I, I think with a lot of the diversity trainings and a lot of the pressures that come about it for white people that never really had organic experiences with black people in their lives, and these are good people. These are people who want to do well, you know, and who care about these issues deeply. A lot of these trainings can kind of leave them with a sentiment of, like, I need to, I need to approach black people with like white, 
gloves on, you know, yeah. and be real soft and gentle, you know, because they've endured racism. Yeah. You know, when it's like the the resilience of black people is like self-evident in the fact that you endured racism. And, sl- and you know? we still are. And you still are. Yeah. And it's like, and there were plenty of instances where black communities were on the up and up. And it's like, people just kept stomping on it, you know? It's like, no, you know, I'm gonna smush that right there. It's like, we just, we just need to get out of the way and stop yeah. doing that. Um, and, you know, and, that, and that's what I'm inspired by is um, the, the, the diversification of the mental health field is changing rapidly. Like I see it happening and I, I saw it, and I can say that because I was a educator and I taught at the master's level and doctoral level uh, for eight years. And um, I shared this with you. It's like the last two years that I was in higher ed in a doctoral program, like I'm not, 50% of my students were black women. You know, and so it's like, there, 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 there's a- We are quickly an R, yeah, becoming the most educated group. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and like brilliant people that are gonna do some um, really, really great things. And maybe on that note, one of the, I, I learned this when we were um, at our company, uh, reun- whatever it was down in Disney. Um, one of those students I was just talking about just got hired as a CD um, for an Ellie mental health clinic in North Carolina. That's um, fantastic. Um, so, you know, it's like all of this is happening. We're getting there. It's going to take time to fully manifest. Um, but in the meantime, let's keep having conversations that can help people figure out what your role is in it and also what your role isn't. Absolutely. And we really want to find a way to bring black men. Yeah to this field, you know, there's nothing more empowering than, you know, two brothers that can sit there and they can talk about their lived, shared experiences and give each other advice. But to find black male therapists is extremely difficult. And a lot of that has to do with, you know, the pay disparities within the field. So while we're trying to get people more involved in joining the field, we also have to include the pay equity Yes. pieces of it too um if we want to attract and retain top talent in this area so you know i love that black women are coming out in droves and really showing out for mental health but i also want to do what i can to inspire the black men to do it because they they have such a unique perspective in how they deal with all of the things that's on their plate as well. And I feel like a lot of times there's a lot of focus on women and we're forgetting about our men. And so I wanna make sure that we're definitely keeping them on the forefront as well. Cool, cool. Well, that'll be uh, next time we do this. I don't know if we can call it an episode. We just did this spontaneously. Um, I'm just gonna post it. I hope I don't get in trouble, (laughs) but it'll be out there. I'm, I'm I'm probably gonna leave right now and edit it. So, um, so this was, this was great. You know, I love these conversations. I love what's happening. I love connecting with, um, folks like you to know that it's like, this stuff is happening. Absolutely. You know, it's like, there's a lot to believe in. There's, it's inspiring. Um, I I would say at the end of the day. So yeah, let's just kind of keep rolling, you know, keep doing what you're doing. I'll uh, keep paying attention. Um, I do sleep easier at night knowing that if I do something stupid again i'll probably have an email about you within <laughs> you know from me within 24 hours um and so it allows me to be a bit more you know disinhibited um, yeah so yeah we'll we'll keep doing what we can to figure out all the things that got to get figured out because if it's not people making it happen it's not going to happen absolutely